بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, So now we are continuing in our episode regarding the ten who were promised paradise and alhamdulillah we have done Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali we have done Talha and Zubair we have done Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and now we are going on to the next uh, the seventh of them after this we have two uh, so today we'll do Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas um, I had already mentioned he is from the tribe of the Banu Zuhra along with Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. So there are two of the ten that are from the mini tribe of the Banu Zuhra. And the Banu Zuhra, we should all be familiar with it because, as I said, and a reminder, it is the tribe of Amina, the mother of the Prophet. So Amina binti Wahab, Amina binti Wahab is the mother of the Prophet. And Wahab had a brother, Wuhayb. Wahab had a brother, Wuhayb. And Wuhayb's son is Abu Waqqas. And Abu Waqqas' son is Sa'ad. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas ibn Wuhayb. Okay? So, in this sense, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is a uh, type of khal, a type of uncle of the Prophet from his mother's side. Or to be more precise, he's actually a cousin. But they would call the people from the mother's side khal. And there is a hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, uh, slightly weak, but uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi saw Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, and he said, "This is my khal. This is my uncle. So show me who can have a khal like this." So it's a type of boasting that's a praise for Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas that uh, it, he is from the akhwal, from the mother side of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was born around 17 years before uh, the preaching of Islam, before the preaching of Islam. And he has been described as being short and stocky, not a very strong build, uh, dark complexion, uh, flat nose, he has a coarse uh, uh, skin and a, a very curly hair. And it is also said that uh, he had a, uh, I said a flat nose, and he had a lot of hair on his body. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, uh, عن, was not known for his physical strength in terms of his, his looks. Nonetheless, he was known for his acumen, for his intelligence, and he was especially known for his eyesight, how good his eyesight was. And that's why out of all of the Sahaba, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas had the reputation of being the best marksman. The marksman means the one who can uh, shoot a bow and arrow and get the mark. He was the best of the Sahaba in this regard. And he was, as we said, 17 years old when the da'wah of Islam began. And he accepted Islam, the seventh of all of the people. And he was one of the five whom Abu Bakr converted to Islam. So he is of that original batch, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. And it is said that when he converted to Islam, he did not even have any facial hair on his, uh, uh, on his face, which means, again, around 17 is the, is the perfect age to describe him. So he was essentially a teenager when he accepted Islam. And his daughter Aisha, uh, later on, reported the story of his conversion, that she said that before Sa'ad converted to Islam, he saw a dream as a teenager. He saw a dream that he was immersed in darkness, and he could not see anything. He was lost. And he saw the full moon come in front of him. And in front of the full moon, he saw Abu Bakr and Uthman and Zayd uh, ibn Haritha. He saw all of these people in front of the full moon. And he went to them and he said, where did you find this moon? Meaning, I couldn't see the moon. Now you are all here. When did you find this moon? And they said, we have just found it. We have just seen it right now. And the next day, he then heard about the Prophet Sallallahu through Abu Bakr, and he knew that Ali had converted, and Uthman had converted, and Zayd had converted. And so this was the interpretation. The moon was our Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba had found the moon. And so uh, he converted to Islam, uh, the seventh convert to Islam. And all of these ten, all of these ten, they are of the earliest batch of converts, and they have done each and every milestone uh, for the protection of Islam. Uh, it appears that Sa Ibn Abi Waqqas's father had passed away. I could not find any mention of him in the books of Sirah that I have at my disposal. And it appears that his father had already passed away by the time he converts. He does not have any mention at all. And Sa'ad was very close to his mother. And this story is well known to all of us. This is one of those famous stories we hear about all the time. The story of Sa'ad and his mother. He was, of course, typically when the father passes away. So then especially the son becomes especially attached to the mother. And there's a very tight relationship and bond. And uh, Sa'ad converted to Islam and his mother 
was a strong believer in the idols. She was a uh, ardent, a fervent believer in the idols. And she was very distressed that Sa'ad had accepted Islam. And she begged him, pleaded with him, uh, got angry at him, did everything that a mother, mother does. And Sa'ad would not leave Islam. And so when all else failed, she then resorted to uh, emotional blackmail. And she said to Sa'ad uh, that I have heard that your prophet teaches you to listen to your mothers. And I have made a vow, I will not eat or drink until I die, unless you leave this religion. So obey me as your prophet says, or else you will be the cause of my death. That's like the worst emotional blackmail. Right? And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was very uh, overcome emotionally and he left the house. He didn't want to see what his mother would do. And his mother followed through with that threat. She refused to eat or drink for the next day, the second day, the third day she is going in and out of consciousness and she is literally dehydrating. You can only stand, you know, maximum, what, two, three days without water, four days, then you are gone. And she is going in and out of consciousness. So some of the relatives of Sa'ad drag him back to the house and say, look at your mother, look at what you have done. And remember, this is very early Islam. The Quran is still being revealed and all of the rulings that are going to come have not yet come. So Sa'ad does not know what to do. He, he thinks uh, at the time he doesn't know there could be a third option which we'll come to in a while, and he doesn't know what to do. And uh, he visits his mother, and she is in and out of consciousness, and she awakes and sees him, and she becomes happy thinking that, okay, now you're going to come back to worship the idols. You've come back to me, this means you will come back to worship the idols. And Sa'ad is very emotional, but he says that, Ya Ummah, O oh my mother, even if you had a hundred souls, and each one of them left in front of me, I would not go back to worshipping the idols, I will not go back to the deen of kufr. So, eat or don't eat, I am not going to change. So, he essentially called her bluff, he essentially said, I'm not going to eat, it doesn't matter what happens, I'm not going to go back, uh, or sorry, I'm not going to go back to the religion of the uh, uh, of paganism. So when his mother uh, saw this, then obviously, I mean, what is she going to do? She then uh, broke her fast and did uh, resume eating and drinking. Uh, and it was because of this that Allah revealed in the Quran, Surah Luqman. It's because of this Allah revealed Surah Luqman, uh, the famous verse, Surah Luqman. So this verse came down as a result of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. That Allah says in the Quran that husna that we commanded uh, man to be good to his parents, and then Allah says wa in jahadaka ala an tushrika bi ma laysa laka bihi ilmun fala tuti'huma wa sahibhuma fi dunya ma'rufa. And if they try to force you to worship the false gods, do not listen to them. And Continue to accompany them with kindness in this world. Continue to accompany them with kindness in this world. So Allah Azza wa Jal affirmed that Sa'ad should not have gone back to idol worship. And he told Sa'ad and all of the people that even if they are harsh and, and, and want you to go back, don't worship the idols, but treat them in a manner and say to them words that are good and kind. And so, yani, Sa'ad's technique and tactic was appropriate for his time. And it might be, if, if a similar situation were to be, uh, were to be uh, repeated or whatnot, as we know, in Islam, there are concessions given that if Sa'ad simply said something to make his mother eat or whatnot, he would have been forgiven. But at the time, he doesn't know. And at the time, the, 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 those details haven't come down. And also, nobody knows Sa'ad's mother better than Sa'ad. And he probably understood that she is going to eat, which what she did. When he called her bluff, she ate. So we also have to give credit that Sa'ad knew what he was doing. And uh, it wouldn't have led to his actual mother's death, which was in fact exactly what happened. So this is one of those famous stories that Sa'ad uh, is well known for. And that is that his refusal to go back to idolatry, uh, even though there was a very strong emotional blackmail from his mother to do so. Sa'ad also has the distinction and the honor 
of being the first person to draw blood defending Islam. The first person to get into uh, a, a fight and this is drawing blood. And this happened in one of the early stages of Mecca when the Muslims would pray in one of the valleys of Mecca. So this is before they had Darul Arqam, Ibn Abil Arqam, before they had Darul Arqam, where would they pray? They couldn't pray in front of the Kaaba. They would go and pray in some of the nooks and, cre and crevices of the valleys of Mecca. They would walk outside and they would find their places because Mecca was lots of valleys up and down. And the people of Mecca knew these valleys inside out. So groups of them would go out and they would pray and then they would come back inside the city. So in one of these occasions, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas was with uh, the Sahaba and the Prophet and they were praying. And a group of the uh, youngsters of the Quraysh, meaning the teenagers of the Quraysh, followed them, wanting to tease them, wanting to harm them. And when they were praying, they then attacked with their sticks and stones and whatever. And this was when Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, they didn't have any weapons on them. They're not going armed and prepared. All he had was a, a stick that was used for the camels. You know, the camel, which you hit the camel with. That's all he had. And so he used this to defend uh, the Prophet ﷺ and to fight back the people. And that was when he hit uh, uh, one of them. Uh, and that was the first blow that caused blood to flow in the defense of Islam. And the person that he hit, by the way, uh, is also very famous in the seerah. He is one of the worst of the Quraysh. His name is Abdullah ibn al-Akhtal or Abdullah ibn Khatal. And he is mentioned numerous times in the seerah as one of the worst of the worst. So you can imagine this guy goes back. He's attacking the Muslims while they're praying. And uh, this is the person uh, who remembers Abdullah ibn Akhtal. Any names? Any Abdullah ibn Akhtar, we mentioned his whole story two years ago or three years ago, whenever. No, not that one, no. Abdullah ibn Akhtar uh, was the one who in the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ gave a list of six people. And he said, kill them wherever you find them. Right? Of these six, three were eventually forgiven, remember. Only three actually were killed. And Abdullah ibn Akhtal or Khatal, both are, are, are mentioned, was one of them. And so Abdullah ibn Akhtal ran to the Kaaba and held on to the doors of the Kaaba. Right? This is Abdullah ibn Akhtal. So when the Sahaba found him there, now this is the most sacred place in all of the world. The Prophet said, and they came to him, Ya Rasulullah, he's holding on to the doors of the Kaaba. So even though the Prophet had made no exception, right? They thought they'd find him in an alleyway, they find him in his house, they found him in front of the Kaaba. And even the Sahaba, they're like, we don't know what to do now. So they went back to the Prophet and they said, what should we do? He's holding on to the Kaaba. And that was when Uqtulu who kill him even on the Kaaba. These are the no exception given for those six people. Now three of them even repented and they were forgiven. So Abdullah bin Akhtar was one of those who didn't repent to the very end. He did not repent. And what did he do? Again, there's a long list of things. But one of them was that he pretended to be a Muslim. He came to Medina as a Muslim. Then he became murtad and he killed some Muslims. He stole their property and he went away. So there's a long list of treachery and deceit. When he returned to, Medi uh, to Mecca, he then uh, did a number of things as well. Uh, paying money to write hijat, which is the worst type of poetry, of propaganda and whatnot. So he definitely did a lot of things. But this goes back all the way to uh, the beginning, Abdullah ibn Akhtal or Khatal. So Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas is the one who uh, first hits Abdullah ibn Akhtal. Sa'ad does not seem to have migrated to Abyssinia. He did not migrate to Habasha, uh, perhaps because uh, Allah knows best, but there was no threat for him from him physically. Allah knows best why that is the case, but he seems to have been safe in Mecca. And he was of those who obviously migrated to Medina. He migrated to Medina, and in Medina, uh, barely a few months after migrating, the Prophet Sallallahu appointed him the commander of one of the first expeditions against the Quraysh. This is before the Battle of Badr by 9-10 months. So even before Badr, he is appointed a military commander of a small expeditionary force that the Prophet ﷺ sent to attack some of the caravans of the Quraysh. Now even though the caravan was not actually caught because the Prophet ﷺ said to, to Sa'd that go to such and such a point, if you don't get them by that point, come back. So Sa'd says, in, uh, when he's narrating the story, that we traveled all night, every night, and during the day, we would hide. 
Nobody could see us wherever they were hiding in the, the mountains. And then they would travel the whole night again. For five days we traveled non-stop for five nights until we arrived at that location. Then when we arrived at that location, uh, the Quraysh caravan had already passed by. So we realized that we would not be able to catch them. So we returned back. But the point being that our Prophet Wasallam appointed uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas as a commander of the expedition from very early on and we will see Sa'd radiallahu anhu excelled as a military commander. He was a military genius and to him we owe a huge credit by the blessings of Allah for some of the future victories that are going to take place. Sa'd as well participated in the battle of Badr and he fought one of the bravest, uh, one of the most ferocious uh, battles, uh, one of the most ferocious uh, fights in the battle of Badr and in fact he was the one who took two prisoners of war and also managed to uh, kill one of the uh, Qurashi. Uh, tragically his own brother died in the battle of Badr fighting for the Muslims. His brother was also a Muslim and he died one of the people who died one of the few people who died in the battle of Badr was the younger brother of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Uh, an interesting point at the battle of Badr was that Sa'd uh, when he uh, killed this person from Quraysh he took the armor or the sword and he went back to the process and he said oh messenger of Allah I'm the one who killed this man can I get his armor or sword and realized that up until that point in time, there was no law about what is to be done with ghanima. There's no sharia revealed. And the Prophet ﷺ was aware of the previous sharia. What was the previous sharia? You keep it? You, 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 you are not allowed to take it. It was haram to take it. And in the time of Musa, they would gather it all up and Allah would cause a, 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 a thunder or a lightning to come from the heavens and it would cause the entire ghanima to disappear in front of their eyes. So the ghanima had previously been made haram to the previous ummas. So when Sa'ad brought the sword, the Prophet said, this is not permitted for me or for you. Go and leave it. Go and throw it where you found it. So Sa'ad went back and he put it back where it was found, and he felt in his heart, because it's human nature. But he said, Sami'na wa ta'ana, what Allah, what his messenger has willed, then that is fine for me. And uh, when he was still on the battlefield after the battle of Badr, somebody came to him and said, the Prophet is calling you. So he went back, and he said, the Prophet said, that I had told you to leave it, now I am telling you, you can take it, because Allah has revealed verses in the Quran. And then he recited, Surah Al-Anfal Yas'alunaka an al-Anfal Qul al-Anfal lillahi wa rasul Fattakullah and, and the verses go on So essentially in Surah Al-Anfal Allah allowed the ghanima to be taken by the uh, people And our Prophet Sallallahu said Five are the things that are made halal for me, they were not made halal for anyone before me. No one before me this was permitted for. I, it is now halal for me. Allah has made it easy or permitted for me. And he lists some of the things of fiqh. Of them, by the way, is uh, 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 that this whole earth has been made a place, a place to do wudu and a place to pray. So wherever a person is, they may do wudu and pray right then and there. Whereas previously, you had to go to a synagogue or a church or whatever to actually pray their weekly salah or whatever. And to this day, they have to go to a temple or a place to pray. They cannot do that prayer outside of the temple. And this was the sharia of Musa alayhi salam. It was the sharia, sharia of the previous prophets. You need to build a tabernacle. You need to build a holy place. And that holy place have to have these conditions. Then you have to pray inside of that place. For our sharia, alhamdulillah, we pray in our offices, in our cubicles, we pray in the sand, we pray in the auditorium, we pray wherever we are. This is a concession given to us. It was not given to any other prophet. As well, the concession given of wudu. How to do wudu. Subhanallah, if you look at the ahkam or the rulings of especially some of the ultra-orthodox of the Jewish community. Honestly, it is mind-boggling that how they can do a, a tahara is very difficult for them. So for them, the water has to be natural water that is running. Okay, so the water cannot be stagnant. If the water is in a pool, this is not a pool, imagine a pool or a container. You cannot do your ghusl from that water. 
Now, if you're living next to the Mississippi River, you're fine. But if you're living in the middle of a place where there's no constant rain and there's no river flowing, what are you going to do? They have their techniques, by the way. I was talking to a rabbi a few weeks ago. I mean, Ajib, they have their, their techniques to get out of it. Somehow the water is flowing and whatnot. But technically speaking, they must do ghusl from rain water or from flowing water that is not kept stagnant. So they cannot take a bucket and fill up from the running water and then take it to their, uh, to their, their place. And that is why ultra-Orthodox synagogues, this is something maybe some of you don't even know, ultra-Orthodox synagogues, they actually have a special ghusl chamber where the local Jewish community has to go take a ghusl every time they need to take a ghusl. Can you just think about that now? Okay? Think about how difficult that will be. Every time you need to take a ghusl, huh? with my utmost respect, sometimes the women complain about the ghusl issue and whatnot. Imagine they're making the ghusl, you have to go all the way to the temple every time to make ghusl, right? Thank Allah our sharia says turn the, 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 the shower on and just do ghusl there, okay? Because they're going to have to go get an appointment. And I'm not joking, this is the, the I mean obviously we're talking about the ultra-orthodox, not the uh, conservative and reform, right? Their sharia is so strict in this regard. So our Prophet said what? That the whole world has been made a place of tahur. Wherever you are, if you have water, any water, fine. If you don't have water, we have a concession they didn't have. And that is tayammum. They did not have that concession. We have that concession, right? Anyway, I'll go into my tangent. What else is in that five list? Ghanima. Ghanima. No prophet before me had been allowed ghanima, and Allah has made it halal for me. Now, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas was the one on whose question and hands ghanima became halal. Okay, so this is of the blessings of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Uh, we already mentioned that Sa'ad was well known for his sharp eyesight and the fact that he was the best marksman out of all of the uh, Quraysh. And this was especially shown in the Battle of Uhud. In the Battle of Uhud, Sa'ad received his highest honor from the Prophet wasallam, And that is when uh, the Prophet wasallam was surrounded in the most, um, one of the most um, traumatic or one of the most uh, difficult incidences in the entire seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu and that is when uh, the uh, contingent of Khalid ibn al-Walid had doubled back and he was only left with a small group of people and Sa'ad was one of those who eventually found him, the first contingent to eventually find him and Sa'ad began shooting arrows at every person that was coming Every person that was in the vicinity and he could see and it was coming up the mountain, Sa'ad began shooting arrows and our Prophet was inside the crevice and Sa'ad was on top of the crevice handing him the, the uh, arrows. Some of the other Sahaba were collecting the arrows and the Prophet is handing the arrows to Sa'ad and Sa'ad is the one now taking his bow and constantly shooting the people that are coming and that was when our Prophet gave the highest honor to Sa'ad when he said, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi Irmi ya Sa'ad that go and shoot them with your arrow, may my mother and father be given in ransom for you. And Ali ibn Abi Talib said that famous statement that Ma Jama and Nabi Sallallahu Qat illa li Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. The Prophet never combined between his mother and father, meaning the expression, May my mother and father be given for you. He never combined between his mother and father except for Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Now we said in uh, two weeks ago that this is Ali's statement. There's one more Sahabi that this was also said for, and that is Zubair. Zubair ibn Awam. When was it said? On the night of on the night of Khaybar, on the Banu Quraida. When when it was Zubair ibn al Awam who went to check on the Banu Quraida and then he came back. So this is also authentically narrated but it is not as well known. It's not as famous. This incident of Sa'ad is much more famous because there were more eyewitnesses. And it is also reported in more books of hadith. So this is why Ali said nobody was combined except for Sa'ad. But we know that uh, sorry, Zubair was also combined uh, between them. Uh, an interesting uh, side note here. It is said, this is one of the theories. We don't know exactly who did it. That's why. Uh, the one who injured the Prophet Sallallahu in the Battle of Uhud. The one who uh, thrust the javelin and caused the... Uh, the, the, the teeth of the process and to fall out. It is said 
that this was the older brother of Sa'ad Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas. It is one of the names given. Again, it's as we when I mentioned the Battle of Uhud, I mentioned one of the, the biggest issues about the Battle of Uhud is to reconstruct in detail because it was a tragedy. We have snippets here and there to try to piece it together to form a coherent whole and to have each and every one of the names. We don't even know exactly how many injuries because again, different books give different things. No doubt the worst injury was the premolar of the process and falling out and uh, uh, the fact that it had to be pulled out and the blood was coming from his cheek. So who did that injury? There's two or three names mentioned uh, in the books of Sirah, two or three candidates to for this worst person of the Quraysh. And uh, one of the names mentioned is the older brother of Sa'ad, and that is Utbah ibn Abi Waqqas. And Allah knows best who it was. Who it was. Um, Sa'ad, uh, Sa'ad as well, of course, was... Um, well, w with regards to this phrase, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi, Sa'ad himself narrated this as well that I heard the Prophet say this about me, and his children narrated from him. So, rightfully, he was very proud of this praise, and it is narrated from him and from others as well that the Prophet uh, said this as well. Uh, he also participated in the other uh, battles. Um, uh, I looked through the Sira. I mean, nothing that we can say is of uh, extra significance. He's being a part, he's doing his duty in all of the other battles. And his main, if you like, claim to fame after this, after the Fidaka Abi Wa Ummi, was to be appointed in the time of. Uh, the end of Abu Bakr and then the beginning of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala to be the general of the army that marches against Sassanid Persia. And this really is the greatest legacy of uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is to be the leader of all of the armed forces that are going against what at that time was the single most powerful political and military entity in the whole world and that is the Persian Empire. Sa'ad is the we will call the five-star general. He is the big guy. Everybody is underneath him. He is put in charge of conquering Persia. And what a great honor that is, and what a great responsibility. So Sa'ad, and of course, Khalid ibn walid went the other way, right? Khalid went to the Byzantine Empire. So Khalid, so essentially it can be said that Sa'ad and Khalid ibn walid these are the two greatest military geniuses of the Sahaba. So the one of them is sent against the Romans, the other is sent against the Persians. And it is Sa'ad who then goes and fights the Persians. And therefore, we owe him with the blessings of Allah and by the barakah of Allah, we owe the conquest of Iraq and Iran because that is the Sassanid Empire. Allah blessed Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas to be the one at whose hands the largest conquest occurs. This is not to trivialize Khalid ibn Walid, but in terms of size, Sa'ad wins. In terms of sheer land mass, Sa'ad wins. Khalid had some very difficult fighting with the Romans. And we are not at all trivializing the significance of conquering half of the Byzantine Empire and conquering Damascus. And of course, Khalid gets Baytul Maqdis. So there's no, we're not competing here. But in terms of land size, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas conquered more than Khalid ibn Walid, even though the both of them, of course, they have each one has their fadl. But look, simply to be compared with Khalid ibn Walid shows you who Sa'ad is. Simply put, to be put on the same level. You're in charge of this, you're in charge of that. This makes us understand how great was the military genius of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And Sa'ad went to uh, what is now Iraq uh, in the famous la or the valley of Qadisiyah, the famous plains of Qadisiyah. And at the plains of Qadisiyah, he began a series of dialogues and emissaries with Rustum, the uh, general of the Persians. And uh, as we all know, this was when the famous conversation took place uh, with Nu'man ibn Muqran and Rustum, when uh, Nu'man says to Rustum uh, that uh, We have come to free people from worshipping other people to, to worshipping the Lord of the people. Uh, that famous conversation. Sa'ad is not there because it's not befitting that the govern that the, the general himself walks into the general's office. That's 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 just not 
what you do. But Sa'ad's the one sending the emissaries. He's the one trying to make them uh, basically avoid a military fight. As you know, the Persians insisted to fight. And so uh, the famous battle of Qadisiyah begins. And the battle of Qadisiyah is the one that opens the door for, for Iraq and then Iran. Iraq and Iran are right now under the Sassanid uh, rule and the Battle of Qadisiyah takes place. It is a battle that lasted four continuous days. It is one of the most difficult battles of early Islam and it is simply an astounding miracle. There is no other way to explain it. There is no other way to explain it where a small group of Barely, I mean numbers differ as I said, 10,000, 12,000, however many you want to put it. You are fighting against the Persian Empire. The least of which is going to be 150, 200,000 at that point in time. And you're fighting against Yazdajard and you're fighting against the people that have trained for centuries. And the Arabs had trained for hardly anything to fight against these people. There is no question that these early conquests are a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is at the head of this miracle when it comes to Sassanid uh, Persia. Now Sa'ad himself, by the way, when the battle was taking place, he was afflicted with a very, very severe fever. And uh, they say there was some type of ailment or disease that he, he had, that his skin was, was suffering and whatnot. So he was not able to physically fight in Qadisiyah. He was extremely sick. But despite his fever and despite his sickness, he would take military charge. Reports would be given to him continuously. He would be updated in his tent even as he was lying sick. And he took charge of the logistics and troop arrangements from his uh, headquarters. And they say his headquarters in Qadisiyah was a old uh, Iranian fortress that had been abandoned. So uh, Sa'ad took it over and he reconverted the fortress into a living fortress, an actual fortress. And then he took charge from that fortress. And as I said, the battle lasted for four days, three days and three nights, essentially non-stop fighting. People were fighting in shifts. And... The, uh, uh, the first day the Muslims were suffering, the second day they thought they had lost. But in the third day they redoubled their efforts and they continued fighting and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the one who gave them the tactic. Uh, the, one of the main problems that the Muslims had was the elephants. The elephants in the army of the Sassanids and the Muslims did not have any experience fighting against the elephants. And it was Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas who again being the sharp military marksman that he is, he saw the elephant's armor covering everything except, of course, the eyes. And so he commanded the archers, aim for the eyes of the elephant. SubhanAllah, can you imagine how far they're going to be? But this is now the military genius now. So when they started aiming for the eyes, obviously the elephants went wild with rage and, and, and blindness and they began swirling and attacking their own. Because when the elephant is blinded, it's going to do anything. So it kind of worked against the, the, the Sassanids, right? So they, they, they found the elephants trumpeting against them. And this was when the Muslims then managed to gain more ground. And on the fourth day, that was when uh, the general was killed and uh, the great victory of Qadisiyah took place. And this victory of Qadisiyah was not uh, the, the, the greatest in terms of military might, but it was... The first domino, and you know the first domino is the most important one. That when this fell, the, the fear that inflicted the Persians and the courage and morale boost in the Muslims was simply unprecedented. Yes, the Jard himself fled from his palace because of Qadisiyah. Qadisiyah is not taking place outside of his palace. It's taking place at the borders. But when Qadisiyah takes place, this is when Yazdajad panics and he flees with his family, not immediately, but after a few weeks when the news and all that. He, that the, the, essentially, it was the most important domino to fall and it was the first battle and it was a resounding victory uh, for the uh, Muslims. And so Sa'ad marches onwards and now he makes his way straight to the capital of the Sassanid Empire. After Qadisiyah, Sa'ad then marches to the capital and what is the capital called? Al Mada in Tesifan. Okay, Isfahan is in Iran. Isfahan is in Iran. Uh, the capitals were in Iraq right now. Now, of course, back then, Iraq and Iran are one land per se, right? Only later, 
uh, Iraq becomes Arabicized, and so it is now Arab culture, and Iran remains on the original language of the Zoroastrians with Arabic additions, which is Farsi. Okay. Otherwise, at this point in time, Iraq and Iran essentially are one land, the Sassanid uh, Empire. So everybody is speaking uh, uh, Persian. Nonetheless, Iraq did have more Arabs because it's closer. So there was more of a familiarity with Arabic. And even when the conquest took place, this is a tangent, you're not related, even when the conquest took place, you had massive amounts of migration to Iraq, not as much to Iran. And so Iraq becomes Arabicized, right? You have large groups of the Banu Tamim in particular migrating to Iraq. You don't have that many migrating to Iran. So Iran retained its language and some of its culture. And that's why Iran never spoke Arabic throughout its entire history. Iran always spoke Persian. But Iraq let go of its Persian very early on and it became Arabicized, especially when Ali ibn Abi Talib moved there. And then of course afterwards the Abbasids moved there to Iraq. So obviously when the Abbasids are moving to Iraq and the Abbasids are pure Arabs and they are from the Quraysh, what's going to happen? Iraq becomes Bilad al-Arab. It becomes a pure Arab land, so much so that nobody speaks Persian anymore, by and large, you know. I mean, in the sense, not as a mother language in Iraq, right? So in any case, back to our story here. So, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Uqas matches onto, in Arabic, is called Mada'in. In English, is called Tesiphon. And it's a silent C, C-T-E, Tesiphon, C-T-E-S, C-T-E-S-I-P-H-O, and Tesiphon. And Tesiphon is the capital of the Sassanid Empire. It has been the capital for over 300, 400 years. The city Tesiphon goes back 800 years. It is one of the most magnificent cities in the world at the time. It is, some say, the largest city in the world at the time. If it's not the largest, it's in the top two or three. It is one of the most beautiful cities. Why would it not be when it is the capital of Iran? Can you imagine the glorious empire of the Persians, of the Sassanids, is now concentrated in Tesiphon. And Sa'd bin Abi Waqas goes to this city and there is the uh, river uh, uh, of the Dajla, the, the, um, uh, the Euphrates is outside of it and he camps outside. He camps outside and the river is between him and Tesiphon is on the other side. They don't know what to do. Months go by and they're attempting to figure out ways to cross. And then here is where some books uh, say a miracle occurred. And some say that he took advantage of a, a, a basically a low tide or whatever. Whatever the case might be. And it is not surprising if a miracle occurred. Some of you might have heard of this, this story. But when you really go back to the sources, Allah knows best. The earliest sources don't portray this as a miracle. Now... We believe in miracles, and that we have no problems affirming miracles. But most early sources don't view this as a miracle. It seems later sources kind of read in a miracle. Allah knows best, and that is that the horses and the people walked over the water when they crossed over. Allah knows best. It doesn't seem in the earlier sources this happened. It simply seemed that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas was monitoring the situation, and when the time was right, and after a long and protracted, uh, uh, if you like, uh, um, siege, Sa'd ibn Waqqas told his soldiers, put your tawakkul in Allah, we're going to cross over now. And they in fact did cross over, and they had a battle in Tesiphon, and uh, yes, the Jad had fled already because he was worried about the, the Muslims coming, so he and his entourage and the elite guard had fled already. And again, this is not the final battle. There's going to be a series of battles for the next 10 years. It'll take eight years actually to conquer Sassanid and Persia. It wasn't a one year thing. But the two most important battles were the battle of the battle of Qadisiya and this battle of Madain or Tesiphon. These are the two most important battles and then after this there's going to be continue, continue, continue until finally all of, uh, uh, all of the Sassanid Empire is conquered. And so uh, eventually the Muslims conquer Tesiphon and they conquer Madain. And it is here, in my humble opinion, one of the most profound and mind-boggling and significant snapshots of the history of, of Islam takes place. And the more I think about it, honestly, my mind simply boggles with wonder and amazement. Unfortunately, 
and this is the reality of early Islam, we don't have detailed eyewitness accounts. And how I wish, how I wish there had been chroniclers and historians writing down every detail, we don't have that. So we have to fill in with our own imagination. But just imagine, if you will, this city of Tessiphon. And in the center of the city, imagine, and you don't even have to imagine, because the remnants of that center are still standing to this day. The greatest palace in perhaps amongst the history of humanity, the top four or five palaces, and of its time, the greatest palace, it was far more beautiful than the palace of the Roman Emperor. This is the Persians, and the Persians loved pomposity. The Persians loved arrogance and show. And to this day, that palace, which is called Iwan Khusro, Iwan Khusro in Farsi and uh, Taqi Kisra in Arabic, Taqi Kisra in Arabic. To this day, the remnants of that palace, you still have something standing here and there. And it is, of course, a United Nations World Heritage Site. People go there uh, to, to just you know, look at one of the wonders of the world. This is one of the ancient wonders of the world, the Palace of Kisra. It was built over centuries because every Kisra, you know what happens when the king comes, they want to add, they want to they make it bigger and bigger. So every Kisra is essentially expanding and making it bigger. And to this day, the largest single span vault of unreinforced brickwork stands the Taqi Kisra. To this day, 3,000 years or 2,000 years after it was built, because it was built before the conquest, right? I mean, obviously you understand, the palace is, is built before the conquest of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, it is built in a previous time, right? This is like the Hagia Sophia type of thing, like one of those iconic buildings of the world. But it is far more beautiful than anything the Romans have ever done. And to this day, it stands a towering 130 feet, a single beam, without any reinforcements. We see it now, and we are amazed. Can you imagine the Sahaba who haven't even seen a three-story structure in Arabia? There is no three-story structure in Arabia. There is no unreinforced beam that is 10 feet high. The Arabs did not build this type of stuff. Can you imagine them walking in the streets with fountains, with marbles, with actual gold? And to top it off, and to me again, this is wallahi, I mean, you think about it, and I want you to really imagine this you know, when you go back home, even just imagine this. Subhanallah, here you have Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas still wearing his rough, woolly cloak and garment, still dressed the way he would have been dressed in Mecca. This is somebody who has seen Bilal being dragged in the streets of Mecca. He has seen Ammar ibn Yasir tortured almost to death. He has seen Yasir and Sumayya stabbed with the spear. He has seen, what has he not seen? He has participated in Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Ahzab and the conquest of Mecca. He has seen all of this. This isn't one of the new converts. This isn't one of the Tabi'un. They were the bulk. To me, what is mind-boggling, you have Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas walk in to the palace of Kisra. I mean, if that does not blow your mind away, the, Im the, 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 the image of this early convert, right? From where to where? Where did Islam begin? And now, where is it heading up? Wallahi, just absolutely mind-boggling. And who is at his right-hand side? The one Sahabi that deserved to be there. And what is going through his mind? Salman al-Farisi. I mean, absolutely, if I could go back and take a look, Wallahi, what would I give just to take a look at their conversation and their talk and whatnot? Salman al-Farisi, who is over a hundred years old at the time, and he in his youth has never come inside the palace. He must have seen it from the outside. His father must have taken him there because he's a Persian, because he's from a noble family. But he is not from the 
royalty, right? Now he enters the palace of Kisra as a conqueror, subhanAllah. And they walk in to the Ivani Kisra. They walk into the most magnificent room in the world that doesn't even have pillars and beams. It's just a standing structure, actual marble and gold and fountains. And there in the middle of the room is the most magnificent throne known to man of that era, the throne of Kisra himself, subhanAllah. You have Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas walking in and he sees this throne over here. And the first thing that they do right then and there in the middle of the room, in the middle of the Iwan Kisra, what do they do? Right then and there, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas calls the Adhan. It's not time to pray one of the five prayers, but it is time to pray to Allah, Sajda to Shukr. And they stand in Salah. Eight continuous rak'ahs, one after the other, after the other, after the other. No taslim, just shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having seen and witnessed this dazzling beauty. Honestly, for me, this words do not, I cannot describe even the emotions. What, you know, just imagine this here of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas seeing, yani, there is no, nothing, you know, my words lose me here. He is there. This is now his. He is the conqueror with Allah Ta'ala and he sees the Izzah of Islam going in a way that only Allah could have done. A group of people who have no education, they have not trained in the arts of war, but they have Allah on their side. And Kisra was not able to defend his throne from the likes of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas and Salman al-Farisi. So they walk into this grandiose palace and they pray uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they then convert the Ivani Kisra to a temporary masjid. The very room that Kisra would use to dazzle his guests, to confound his, his, his emissaries, to show them you know, how fancy and how rich he is. That room is now being used to pray five times a day. The first thing the Sahaba did when they conquered a land, before they built a house for their own, before they had a roof to sleep in, they dedicated a place for the Salah. And so for temporary time, in the smack middle of the Taqi Kisra, uh, the, uh, the Taqi Khusra, that's where they made the, the, the masjid, but it was temporary. They eventually built a masjid outside and then they moved it obviously over there. Uh, to this day, we have remnants of the palace, but as you know, so many years have gone by, all we know, and Google it. When you go back home, Google it, you know, Ivani Kisra or Taqi Khusra, and you will see for yourself some beautiful architecture and massive columns and whatnot, and they are beautiful to our eyes, and we have seen what have we not seen. I cannot even imagine what the Sahaba would have been thinking as they walk into this and they look at all of this power and opulence and wealth and glory. And these are the very people, especially Sa'ad, out of all of them, Sa'ad has been there from the very beginning. And to me, I don't know of anything similar. Because Khalid and Niza conquer, but Khalid converted right at the conquest. You cannot compare Khalid to Sa'ad. Sa'ad is Sa'ad from the very beginning. And for him to now see all of this, truly it is something that is mind-boggling. So, and then of course the conquests go on and on and on. So essentially, we thank Allah for having blessed us with Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas because it was Sa'ad's military genius and tactics that blessed us with this entire lands of Iraq and Iran and then from there obviously this opened the door for all of these other is Istans you know Afghanistan and Tajikistan and Uzbekistan all of these were opened obviously this is after Sa'ad this is in the time of the Umayyads and early Abbasids but Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is the one who opens that door and he conquers the entire Sassanid uh, land and because obviously of his conquest so Umar ibn Khattab blesses Sa'ad with the governorship of Iraq. You conquered it, it's yours now. So meaning you, you take charge. And this was when groups of people that were not the best Muslims began to migrate to Iraq. Iraq became a thorn in the side of the Muslim Ummah from the early times. They were always problematic issues. The insurrections, the resurrections, the, the uh, mutinies, the, uh, and, and that is why, by the way, uh, different point here, that is why Shi'ism flourished in Iraq. Because Shi'ism allowed a theology of discontent, a theology of rebellion, right? Shi'ism in its initial stage was not as much, 
aqidah as it was politics. The point was that we have an imam, and that imam is going to be the khalifa, and we don't want your khalifa. So Shi'ism primarily was about politics in the beginning. It was about, we have somebody that's a better Khalifa than your Khalifa. And that is somebody from the Al al-Bayt. And so they would have their particular people and they would go and fight uh, the Umayyads and the Abbasids and whatnot. And as you know, lots of different Shi'i revolts took place. And so Shi'ism, that is why it is an Iraqi phenomenon. Because Iraqi, the, the people there, they never really liked the rule, especially of the Khulafa and then the Umayyads. They did not like the rule of the Umayyads, and even when the Abbasids came to power, and the Shia helped them come to power, the Abbasids then said, we're not converting to your ideology, we're going to remain Sunni. So the Shia felt that they had been betrayed by the Abbasids, but that's besides the point here. So, uh, we were saying, so Sa'ad took charge of, of Iraq, groups of people came from a lot of Bedouin tribes, uh, and unfortunately, the, the, this is the very beginnings of what Iraq is going to forebode, what's going to happen in Iraq. The rebellions and the constant irritations. Remember, most of the people who came to kill Uthman were from the newly converted Egyptians and Iraqis. These are the two people that came to uh, to kill uh, Uthman. By the way, those that are from Iraq and Egypt in our times, I'm not, this is back then, don't Danny, don't read it now. This is 1,300 years ago, okay? Any Iraqis in the audience, we're not talking about you. This is 1,350 years ago. So, the, um, the, 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 the new converts and the newcomers to Iraq, they began increasingly getting angry at Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and they began complaining to him and eventually when it wasn't solved, they began complaining to Umar ibn al-Khattab. That Sa'd does this, Sa'd does that, Sa'd does this, Sa'd does that, and they kept on complaining, complaining until finally they even said, and how ridiculous is this, they said he doesn't even know how to pray. Now these new converts think they know how to pray better than Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. So when all of these complaints came, Umar ibn Khattab called Sa'd to Medina. So he traveled all the way to Medina and he asked him, look, they're accusing you of this, 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 what do you have to say? And each and every accusation, Sa'd was easily able to explain or, or what not. And Umar said, that's what I assumed about you. I knew this is all you know, uh, lies or fabrications. So go back and return and, re and resume governorship. And Sa'ad says that, do you expect me to go back to a people who assume I don't even know how to pray properly? Go find another governor. I don't need to be a governor. I have no interest in politics. And he refused to become a governor of any place. And he essentially resigned from political office after this. And he remained in Medina for the next 35 years until his death. He did not get involved in any political issue whatsoever. And in fact, when the fitna took place between the Sahaba, uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was one of the senior most who, there was a small group who refused to take part. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was the senior most of that group who refused to take sides. And he did not get involved at all, so much so he even told his sons and his grandsons, don't even give me news about what's happening between those two parties. I just want to keep my ears even shut. I don't even want to hear what they're doing. Don't even come and tell me. That's how neutral he became. Because he didn't want his qalb even to be affected by the, about the people that he knew and he loved. So he refused to get involved to the point of not even getting information about the battles and who was killed and whatnot. Let it um, be. And therefore, Sa'ad uh, was neither on the side of Ali nor on the side of Muawiyah. He did not participate in Jamal. He did not participate in Safim. He did not participate in any of these battles. And he lived a very, very a political life in Medina, just ibadah and his own business day to day, take care of his family and, and, and that is it. And in fact, it is said that in the time of Muawiyah radiallahu an, when Muawiyah became the Khalifa and Ali has now basically left the scene, that Muawiyah visits Medina and of course Sa'ad is now the senior most Sahabi alive at this point in time. So Muawiyah visits Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and he says, why didn't you take sides? Why didn't you help me? Like now that it's all done, I want to know, why didn't you come and help me? And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said that 
I saw a, a thunder, a dust storm. You know, the desert has the dust storm. I saw a dust storm in the distance, a dust cloud. You know, the 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 dust thing that comes, you know, in the, in the desert, right? I saw that in the distance. And so I gathered my clothes, like, you know, you're going to cover yourself up. And I said, Akhin Akh, and I walked around it until the dust storm left away. Akhin Akh is like uh, just your expression of disgust. Like, Akh, what is this? I don't want anything to do with this, right? So I just gathered my clothes, protected myself, and I went away. I walked the other way until the storm left. Now I can walk normally. So this irritated Muawiyah immensely, radiallahu anhu, irritated him immensely. And he said, I haven't read in the Quran, Allah ever say, Akhin Akh. Rather, what Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْنِنَ قَتَتَلُوا If two groups fight, then try to bring Salah and join one of the sides, and you didn't join this side, and you didn't join that side. Means, I would even understood if you joined the other side. Right? You remain neutral. So he's trying to prod him. Like, I didn't read this Akhin Akh you're talking about. I read Allah say, if one group is Baghi, then you have to fight. So you were neither on this side nor that side. Which side were you on? And here is where we see Sa'ad's bravery. Muawiyah is now the Khalifa. And we know the tensions that took place, and we kind of glossed over them. But clearly, there were some very strong tensions. After all, blood was shed. Tens of thousands of Sahaba died. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas said, it is not possible for me to fight against somebody regarding whom the Prophet wasallam said, you are to me like Harun was to Musa, except that there will be no Nabi after me. Now this is a famous hadith about Ali ibn Abi Talib, and everybody knows it, right? So he is saying, you wanted me to fight on your side against Ali? No way. Between the two of you, if I would have chosen, it would have been him, but I chose neither. That's essentially what he's saying. That you cannot compare to Ali ibn Abi Talib. There's no way I would have joined you. But I chose uh, neither. And so he lived his life in Medina and he passed away. And he was the last of the Ashra Mubashara to die. The last of the Ashra Mubashara to die. He, he lived uh, until uh, the 55th year of the Hijrah. 55th year of the Hijrah. So essentially he died at the age of uh, so uh, 68 was that and then add 78, 79 so uh, 83 80, 82, 83 years old okay, he, he lived to 82, 83 years old which is a very long age for that time frame and then he passed away and he was buried and he is buried I should say in Baqi' al-Gharqad, so his grave is in Baqi' al-Gharqad and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas uh, as with most of the Sahaba and especially the Ashra of the time, uh, he had plenty of wives and milk yameen, a total of at least 11 uh, women with whom he had children with. And so he had over 19 sons and 18 daughters, around 40 children, mashallah, tabarakallah, around 40 children, mashallah. And what Sa'ad is known for uh, was that he was mustajabu da'wah. This is what Sa'ad was well known for amongst the Sahaba. His dua would be responded to. And everybody was scared of the dua of Sa'ad. Sa'ad's dua would be responded to. And well, there are many stories in the books of, of history about Sa'ad's duas. Uh, and especially when somebody had done zulm to Sa'ad, and Sa'ad would respond to that with a dua. And our Prophet ﷺ said, اِتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حجاب. Beware of the dua of the mazloom because there is no veil between that dua and Allah. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas uh, would make dua at times against those who had done dhulm against him. It is said that once uh, a man cursed Ali and his Zubair uh, during the times of fitna. And the, Sa'ad was there. And Sa'ad became angry and he said, take that back. And the man laughed and said, what are you going to do if I don't take it back? What's your, who are you? What are you going to do? So he said, I will make dua against you. So the man mocked him and said, as if you're a prophet and your dua is going to work. So the man refused to take it back. Sa'ad then did wudu and prayed to raka'ah and raised his hands to Allah and said, Oh Allah, if you know that this man has cursed a group of people who have already done good that you have accepted and whose, and your pleasure is already on them, and you know that his cursing has angered you, then make him an ayah for those after him. 
Make him a sign that nobody should curse the Sahaba. And he's cursing Ali and Zubair during a time when a lot of people are cursing Ali and Zubair. Right? This was a time, you know, you understand, in the early Umayyad time, this was common. These are things that are awkward to mention and they're very bad to hear. But it is a fact. This was happening at this time and place. But not in front of Sa'd. Nobody should do it in front of Sa'd. When this man continued to do it, so Sa'd made that dua. And it is said that shortly after this dua, a uh, ra rabid camel, a camel that has rabies, uh, ran out of the pen wild and charged into the crowd. Everybody jumped out of the way and the camel charged straight to this man and stomped him to death in front of the crowd. It is also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. This hadith is in Bukhari. So Sa'ad's du'as are well known. It is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari that when uh, the complaints came from the people of Kufa for the first time, Umar ibn Khattab sent somebody to verify who is going to testify that Sa'ad is doing dhulm. Because the complaints were all lies. Sa'ad is living lavishly. Sa'ad is stealing money. Sa'ad is, I mean, complete lies. This is the people of Kufa, right? These are the same people. They're going to be sending letters to Hussein, by the way. That, that group of people, you get the point here, right? So uh, they, they're complaining about uh, Umar um, uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So Umar sends trustworthy people, go verify. And this person goes to the masjid, stands and says, who is going to testify that Sa'ad is doing dhulm? Nobody stands up. He goes to another masjid. Nobody wants to blatantly, you know, come out and put the name that I testify. Until one man stood up and he goes, I testify that Sa'ad has done dhulm. And I testify that he's... And then a whole list of lies. Complete lies. This is in Sahih Bukhari. Sa'ad raised his hands and he said, Oh Allah, if this man is lying... Because look, when dhulm has been done to you, you have the right to make dua against this person. And that is the weapon of the oppressed. If this man is lying, means he just wants fame and he wants to hurt me for no reason. If this man is, now this is dhulm, and the khalifa is verifying whether Sa'ad has done dhulm. You're going to testify blatant lie that he's done dhulm? And you are nobody and this is Sa'ad? So Sa'ad raised his hand and says, Oh Allah, if this man is lying, make him blind. And allow him to live a long and miserable and wretched life. Subhanallah. What a dua. And the narrator from Sa'ad, his student, says, I would see this man many years later. Sa'ad's gone now. Many years later, his eyelids had gone low because of how old he was and he had lost his sight for many decades and he would be a lecher harassing the girls in the streets as a blind old man like people despised him and whenever somebody would ask him what is your story Masha'nuk? he would say i am an old miserable man who has been afflicted with the dua of sa'ad sa'ad's dua has worked against me that's what I am. That's his story was. So this is Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas uh, ta'ala an. And as usual, we're going to go over some of the hadith. Now Sa'ad uh, an, he actually narrated more hadith than many of the other ashara. Why is this? Because he lived the longest amongst them. Right? So there are probably around 130 a hadith narrated from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Much more than Talha and Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Much more than them. Uh, obviously not as much as Ali and others because they were judges and whatnot. Sa'ad was never a judge. Sa'ad was never placed to be a judge. What we always do, we mention some a hadith about uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas just to get an idea of the a hadith that he uh, narrated. And we're choosing the book Musnad ibn Ahmad, which is the easiest one uh, to find the a hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. The first hadith, and this is perhaps the most famous hadith of Sa'ad ibn Waqqas, that Sa'ad says that after the conquest of Mecca, I fell sick, a very severe sickness. And the Prophet ﷺ came to visit me. And I was worried that I would die in the land that I had left, meaning Mecca. Now pause here. The Sahaba, many of them, did not want to die in Mecca. Because they felt that if they died in Mecca, and this is a, a not a correct feeling, but there was this was their own khushu, their own extra humility. Even though it's a bit too much, but that's their own iman. They felt if they died in Mecca, 
it's as if their hijrah has been cancelled. They've come back to the land they left. And their point was they wanted to be blessed to perform the hijrah, which was one of the biggest blessings of the Sahaba. So he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, I am scared that I'm going to die in the land I emigrated away from. So please make dua to Allah that I be cured and I don't die. He doesn't want to die in Mecca. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put his hand on Sa'ad's chest and he said, Allahumma shfi Sa'ad, Allahumma shfi Sa'ad, Allahumma shfi Sa'ad. And Sa'ad said, it is as if I can still feel the coolness of the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to this day. Still I can feel that if I think about it. And then he said, and this is the most famous hadith of Sa'ad. This mentioned in all the books of fiqh because this is where all of the rulings come from as you will see. Ya Rasulullah, I have a lot of money and I don't have any sons and I have but one daughter. So, should I give all of my money to charity? So the Prophet, and so he literally thinks he's going to die. Sa'ad is certain he's going to die. Of course, subhanAllah, not only is he not going to die, he is going to live another 40 years and have 40 children. But he doesn't know this now. He has but one daughter, and he thinks, how much will she need? She's going to marry a man that's, take care of her, she doesn't need anything. So he says, O Messenger of Allah, should I give my entire money in charity? So he said, no. So he said, okay, two-thirds. He said, no. Okay, one-third. He said, no. Sorry, uh, one-half. Two-thirds, one-half. One-half, no. Okay, one-third, ya Rasulullah. Then he said that famous phrase, which every single student of knowledge memorizes, a thuluthu wa thuluthu kathir. Okay, this is a very famous hadith. It's in Bukhari and Muslim. One-third, okay. But even one third is too much, or it's a lot. Meaning, one third is the max you should give away as wasiyah, and the rest should go to your, to your family. Okay? And even one third is a lot. One third and even one third is a lot. For realize that every single piece of money that you give to your family is sadaqa. And even giving food to your wife is Sadaqah, and if you leave your family wealthy and with money, it is better than you leaving your family poor and they have to beg people for money. Okay, so this is that famous hadith that we all know uh, about this hadith. Uh, and the, the next hadith that we'll do, that one day Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas was with his sheep outside of Medina, and uh, this, is, this is in the time of, of Muawiyah, this is in the time of the Umayyas and whatnot. And one of his uh, sons who was known to be not as righteous, a little bit more, you know, wanting to be powerful and whatnot. One of his sons comes riding on a horse in the distance. And he says to the other son, A'udhu billahi min sharri hadha raqib. I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of this rider. I don't like what he's going to be doing. So the other son comes and he's rude to his father and he goes, Ya abata, O oh father, are you content being a Bedouin taking care of your sheep? While people of your caliber are getting plots of land and power across the country? Meaning what? Meaning what? Get in charge of something. You're sad. You're not. You can go right now and be given an entire city, an entire province. Instead, and he's acting crude probably like a teenager still does to these days, right? You're a Bedouin taking care of your sheep. Are you happy taking care of your sheep when your friends or peers are getting, you know, governorships and whatnot, right? Standard, you know, that's the, the, the thing that, get, do something more, I want some more money. And the uh, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, he hit his son in the chest and he goes, Uskut, quiet. For I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Inna Allah Azza wa Jal yuhibbu al-abd al-taqi al-ghani al-khafi. Beautiful hadith. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-abd al-taqi al-ghani al-khafi. Beautiful, simple hadith. Allah loves the righteous servant who has enough for his needs and who is hidden, not public. Right? Al-taqi, he has taqwa. 
Al-Ghani here doesn't mean the rich. Al-Ghani here means the one who has enough. As long as you have enough to eat. And Al-Khafi. Al-Khafi is the one who is hidden. He's not in the public eye. I want to be that person. I don't want to be the Mr. Publicity person. right? Uh, the next hadith that we'll do, the famous hadith that all of you know, that the Prophet ﷺ, that Sa'd ibn Abi Qas says, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, whoever eats seven ajwa dates from Medina, nothing will harm him on that day until it, the night falls. Right. So this is the famous hadith of seven ajwa dates. It's narrated by Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. Uh, the next hadith that we'll do, the Prophet ﷺ said, so remember this hadith in light of Sa'd's history. That's why I personally love to read the hadith narrated by the Sahaba because you get a, a window into their psychology. You see why they live their own lifestyle. One of the main hadith of Sa'd that Sa'd is well known for is this one. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, there shall be fitna. There shall be trials and tribulations. So the one who sits is better than the one who stands. And the one who stands is better than the one who walks. And the one who walks is better than the one who runs. Meaning what? Staying away from fitna. The one who sits is better than the one who stands. The one who stands better than the one who walks. The one who walks better than the one who runs. Means... Go sit down, don't do anything. In times of fitna, do not get involved in fitna. So we understand why Sa'ad did not get involved in the fitna between the Sahaba. The next hadith we'll do on Sa'ad ibn Waqas. Uh, he said that, uh, and Sa'ad by the way is one of the main narrators of the blessings of Medina. So many a hadith about the blessings of Medina. And where did he live the rest of his life? In Medina. Where did he die? In Medina. Some of the blessings of Baqi' some of the blessings of dying in Medina are narrated by Sa'd. So subhanAllah, all of this psychology uh, is over there. The Sa'd ibn Waqqas said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that between the two mountains of Medina, I have made it a haram like Ibrahim make, made Mecca the haram. Oh Allah, make the barakah of Medina two barakahs. Make it double the barakah of uh, Mecca, and oh Allah, bless the people of Medina in their weights and in their measurements. So he has a hadith about the blessings of uh, Medina. Um, the next hadith that we'll do, just a simple beautiful hadith of uh, fiqh, that Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, one day the people saw him pray one rak'ah of witr, and then go uh, back home. So somebody said to him that, do you only pray one rak'ah witr? Now pause here. Uh, remember, some of the uh, yani Sahaba and Tabi'un, the witr for them was always at the end of the night towards Fajr. Remember, witr in hadith is usually synonymous with tahajjud. Okay, so witr and tahajjud are synonymous because that's when witr is prayed. Now one day Sa'ad, for whatever reason, he's not going to pray tahajjud, so he prays the witr. So uh, the, he said, yes, I pray witr. And then he said, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that the person who prays witr before going to sleep is wise. He's a wise man. And this is also narrated in a similar hadith by Abu Huraira. That Abu Huraira narrated that the Prophet uh, advised me to never go to sleep until I had prayed my witr. Meaning, what is the meaning here? If you're not going to pray tahajjud at the end of the night, then pray tahajjud before going to sleep and finish it off with witr. Okay, this is the meaning here. That if you're not going to pray tahajjud at the end, pray tahajjud at the beginning and finish it off with witr and then go to uh, sleep. Uh, Sa'd ibn Waqas said that, I remember on the day of Uhud, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he was surrounded by two men wearing completely white garments. I had never seen them before and I never saw them after. And they were defending him like I have never seen anybody fight before. So Sa'ad is narrating on the day of Uhud, I saw two angels. He didn't say angels, but he is essentially describing angels. That two men, complete white, and I never saw them before and after, and they were defending the Prophet ﷺ in a manner that I never saw anybody do before or uh, after. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas narrated that one day the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, 
and the women uh, of Quraysh and his wives were demanding and asking many things from him. And some of them raised their voices. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab came. And they all quickly stood up and ran behind the hijab. Now this must have been before the ayat of hijab were revealed. Because after the ayat of hijab were revealed, Sa'ad could not have been there. Okay, The ayat of hijab were revealed most likely in the fifth year of the hijrah. Okay, So before the fifth year of the hijrah, the ayat of hijab were not revealed. And so it was permissible you know, for many women to be sitting in this manner. So Sa'ad is narrating what he saw before the verses of hijab. So when Umar come, came, they all stood up and they ran inside. And the Prophet ﷺ gave permission for Umar to come and he began to laugh. Now Umar didn't understand why he's laughing. So he said, Adhakallahu sinnaka ya Rasulullah, which is an expression in Arabic. Adhakallahu sinnak, may you continue to laugh. May you continue to laugh, O Messenger of Allah. What is the reason why you're laughing? So Umar, uh, sorry, the Prophet ﷺ said, I found it amazing that these women that were around me continue to bring their complaints or whatnot. But then when they heard you, they stood up and they and they fled inside. Okay? And so Umar ibn al-Khattab said, But you, O Messenger of Allah, have more right to be feared and shown respect than me. Then Umar turned his voice to the chambers. And he said, in speaking in the feminine in Arabic, O you females who are enemies of their own selves, are you scared of me and not scared of the Prophet wasallam?" And so one of them responded back, Yes, we are. Because you are harsher and stricter than he is. And the Prophet laughed even more. And then he said, I swear by the one in whose hands is my soul, even if the shaitan sees you on a path, he goes on a different path. So Sa'ad is a witness on that one, okay? Sa'ad is a witness to this beautiful hadith, and he's narrating it to us, you know, many, many years uh, later. Uh, and Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas, that the Prophet wasallam said, whoever does not attempt to beautify the Qur'an is not one of us. Beautiful hadith, simple hadith. Whoever does not attempt to beautify the Qur'an, مَن لَمْ يَتَغَنَّ بِالْقُرْآنِ فَلَيْسَ مِنَّا Beautiful hadith from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. From Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, uh, he's, one day one of his sons was making dua, and he said, Oh Allah, I ask you Jannah and the blessings of Jannah and the silk of Jannah and the palace of Jannah. And then he said, and I seek refuge in you from the fire and from the chains of the fire and from the this of the fire and from the boiling of the fire. So his father, Sa'ad, says to his son, you are asking for much good and you're seeking evil refuge from Allah from much, uh, much bad. And I heard the Prophet wasallam say that people are going to come and exaggerate in making dua. And it is enough for you to say, O oh Allah, give me Jannah and bless me to do the deeds of the people of Jannah. And I seek refuge from Jahannam and cause me to not do anything that leads me to Jahannam. Because once you get Jannah, you'll get everything inside Jannah. Meaning, Sa'ad is teaching his son the proper etiquettes of dua. Okay? Don't go ridiculous in dua. Oh Allah, I want thee, in one version it says, I want the very first house on the right hand side when you enter Jannah. Okay? Like, I want the choice property lot. And Sa'ad, this is not this one, another version. Because Sa'ad says, ask Allah for Jannah, you'll get what's inside it. You don't have, this is takalluf. This is going to an unreasonable level of detail. So this is the point of this hadith, that you ask Allah for that which is uh, reasonable and not go to, uh, to too much detail. Uh, the next hadith, uh, one day the Prophet uh, Sa'ad said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, the one who guards the army, meaning the one who is uh, not actually fighting, but he is set to be the guard. And who was the guard? Who was the one who sat on the corners? The one who is not physically strong. The one who is not the, the best fighter. He's put in the peripheries. He says, Ya Rasulullah, the one who is guarding and the one who is fighting, should they get the same share of the battlefield, of the ghanima? You, you see the question here? The Sa'ad is, because Sa'ad is a warrior in that sense, like he is a military guy, he's in the battle. And he's like, why should the guy who doesn't actually fight? Because realize, so again, not everybody is physically capable of doing, you know, every job. And there are many, many people who are not physically that strong, but there are other things that need to be done. And of them is to guard, of them is to be a scout. 
they're not probably going to carry the sword, but they are doing a role that is important and dangerous. So Sa'ad is saying, should they get the same? And this is a beautiful hadith, memorize it. Sa'ad says, Thakilatka ummuka, uh, sorry, the Prophet said, Thakilatka ummuka, uh, uh, Ibn Umm Sa'ad. Yani, may your mother lose you, is like, are you serious? Are you, can you actually say this? وَهَلْ تُرْزَقُونَ وَتُنْصَرُونَ إِلَّا بِضُعَفَائِكُمْ This is the famous hadith. Why else do you think Allah helps you and Allah gives you rizq except because of your oppressed and weak people? The du'afa are the ones why we win battles, not the strong people. The weak people are the ones whom Allah helps more than the strong people. How else do you think Allah's rizq and blessings come except with those du'afa that you are saying they should get a share of the, of the booty or not, right? So this is a very, very powerful hadith. Time is running up as usual. Um, but there are so many people. I'll just mention a few more. Uh, Sa'ad said that on the day of Uhud, the Prophet wasallam combined between his parents for me. This is the famous one. Sa'ad is narrating to his son. Uh, or his student, sorry, Sayyid ibn Musayyib, the famous Sayyid ibn Musayyib. The Prophet ﷺ combined between his mother and father for me on the day of uh, Uhud. Um, the next hadith, Sa'ad said, I remember a time when I was the seventh of seven along with the Prophet ﷺ. And we had no food to eat except for leaves and grains, like seeds. That's all we had to eat. And we began defecating like the sheep defecate. Little droppings, like the sheep defecate. That's how we would. And now we are uh, a people that, and he mentions the Banu Asad, the Banu Asad, one of the, the tribes of Iraq, that the people of the Banu Asad are now complaining that I don't know my religion. Now what's going on here? He is saying, who are these people to complain about me? I remember a time when we had nothing to eat and there were only seven Muslims. And now the Banu Asad tribe is saying that I don't know my Islam. Wallahi, if that is the case, then I have lost and I have become yani, a, a, a dhillu, like I've become balal. Means he's criticizing uh, the, this, this um, group that is now saying that they know more than Sa'ad ibn Abi uh, Waqqas. Uh, let's just finish up. Let's just finish up over here with uh, one or two important hadith that I thought. Uh, yeah, the, okay, the famous hadith. This is a good one. You should know this one as well. Uh, that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas says that one day I came across the Prophet Sallallahu and he was making dua to Allah. And so I stood and I listened to his dua. And he made a long dua. And then I asked him, what did you make dua? So the Prophet said, I asked Allah for three things. He gave me two and he didn't give me one. This is the famous hadith. I asked Allah, number one, that my ummah not be destroyed by a plague. So he gave that to me. Because many previous ummahs were destroyed by plagues. Number two, I asked Allah that my ummah not be destroyed by a calamity or disaster or drowning. He gave that to me. Number three, I asked Allah that my ummah not fight amongst itself. But he did not give that to me. So this is that famous hadith that uh, the Prophet ﷺ wanted something and for wisdom known to Allah, he did not uh, get it. He did not uh, get it. Uh, okay, we'll finish up here. I, I remember there was one very beautiful hadith that I wanted to do or an important hadith that I wanted to do. And that is the hadith of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas saying, okay, with this we conclude inshallah. Okay, I missed over, I missed over a lot of them because of time as usual. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Waqqas says, Allah revealed four verses in the Quran regarding me. Four verses came down regarding me. So the Sahaba would monitor which verses would come down regarding themselves. And they would consider it a matter of pride. Why wouldn't you? It's a big matter of honor when Allah reveals verses about you, for you, regarding you. So he says, four times Allah revealed something about me. Number one, he said, I captured or got a sword and I asked the Prophet ﷺ, can I have this sword? And he said, leave it. So I left it. And then, and the Prophet ﷺ said, go, go uh, put it where you found it. And then Allah revealed in the Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَلِ الْأَنفَال So this is number one. Number two, that uh, my mother once said to me, 
doesn't your Lord command to be good to your mothers and to listen to the Walidain? Wallahi, I will stop eating and drinking until you reject Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So she stopped eating and uh, she stopped drinking so much so that when she would become unconscious, uh, my family would put some drops of water into her mouth. And Allah then revealed uh, until he came that So this is the second ayah. We gave the story. Okay. The third is that the Prophet وسلم, entered upon me while I was sick and I asked him, O Messenger of Allah, should I give wasiyah for all of my money? And he forbade me. So I said half. He forbade me. I said thuluth. And he was quiet. And so the people took that from me. Now this, it appears that there's no explicit ayah in the Quran about one third. However, perhaps what he's referring to is that Allah mentions in Surah An-Nisa the clear fractions for everybody and Allah also mentions that the wasiyah should be enacted. So how much of the wasiyah this hadith kind of explains the Quran. So it's not as if an ayah came down because of it but and as I said when I was talking about this hadith you cannot study inheritance without this hadith. This hadith is fundamental for fiqh. And you cannot understand the Qur'an or implement the Qur'an without this hadith. So it's as if he's saying, because of me, the Qur'an was explained. The one-third, which is very true. The one-third, all of us know one-third, it came from Sa'd. And then the final one, the final one, he said that <clears throat> one time a man from the Ansar cooked some food and it was at a time when khamar was allowed and he invited people over and so people ate and people drank and when they drank they started speaking and they started boasting about themselves and the Ansar said we are better and the Muhajirun said we are better and the two began to raise their voices until finally one of the uh, Ansar came and smacked one of the Muhajirun uh, with a, uh, a whip or a, uh, a stick or what not and he broke his nose and Sa'ad's nose was broken. Sa'ad's nose was flat nose. And perhaps because of this, they say. And he didn't mention it, but we kind of assume that's what he's saying. That the Ansari smacked the Muhajirun. They're all drunk now at this point in time. And of course, it's not a sin to be drunk at this stage. And so because of this, Allah revealed in the Quran, Ya amnu khamru wal 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 azamu alakum tuflihun. That Allah revealed the prohibition of khamr. So these are the four rulings that came down from Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And with this we come to the conclusion of the story of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And inshallah, next uh, Wednesday, inshallah, I think we'll have to do the two of them uh, together because we don't have that much information, especially about Sa'ad ibn Zayd, very little information. And why is that the case? I'll also tell you inshallah. So we'll inshallah, probably finish up the both of the, uh, the last of the two, Ashara, Mubashara, inshallah ta'ala.